I so don't feel like going anywhere. Sit here a while longer? So we shall, my friend. We have witnessed, and in fact on several occasions incited, many great and weighty events. After all that toil, I believe we deserve a bit of a rest. That we do. Thus passes the glory of the world, drinking with Regis as dawn breaks and Geralt says goodbye by breaking the fourth wall. What an expansion, really. It took me over 30 hours, give or take 30 hours, to go through pretty much all of it. Did all the monster contracts, did all the side quests, didn't do all the scavenger hunts, just a couple of armor sets I could uh, go for, some locations, a couple of locations too, three locations that I didn't go for, question marks that is. But beyond that, I did pretty much everything in the expansion. And if I were to give an honest opinion on Blood and Wine, I feel it's a love letter to old school fans, which were one fans. And in a sense, I feel like an apology to people that see the project throughout the years, since Witcher 2 even, have abandoned. Because there were quite a few things they did change and abandon going from Witcher 1 to Witcher 2, and then going from Witcher 2 to Witcher 3. There's quite a lot to be said on that particular level. In their pursuit of mainstream success, C Project was more than happy to abandon things in their games that made them great, things that old school fans like myself greatly enjoyed. For instance, to give you a perfect example, the moral dilemmas. But before I talk about that, before I talk about story, I don't want to dive into the worst part of Blood and Wine, the thing that make that's bad. And that's the combat design, the gameplay design. Balance-wise, uh, balance it's complete shite. From enemies that you will literally slaughter with ease and pose no fucking challenge to enemies that will want to shot you. Or enemies that are really, really frustrating, even though they're no real challenge, but are simply just frustrating through the nature of their attacks. Enemies that stagger you, enemies that continuously attack you with no care in the world for being staggered themselves, enemies that put explosives on the ground, the bloody spores, uh, the giant centipedes, the vampires, the human enemies coming in groups of two, three, four dozen at once. And uh, the sheer amount of incompetence on display, the bugs, Geralt getting stuck in terrain, unable to move, Geralt dying because he swung the wrong way and compared to what you intended to, bugs in terms of being able to lock on enemies, and many, many other issues. Not only are, are there bugs and glitches, but there's problems in the very design of the game. C Project feels the need to add a bunch of useless shit in their game for no bloody good reason, they decide to go with multiple difficulty levels in their game to try and appeal to various crowds. You know what the problem is with so many RPGs that makes them complete and utter shit? They try to be everything at the same fucking time in terms of their gameplay design, their combat design. They try to appeal to everyone at the same time. May I just give a word and advice here? Don't. Just focus on what you want to be. Focus on a solid gameplay system. Get rid of the fucking difficulty settings because you don't. You clearly are not balancing them properly. As I said, going from enemies that two free shot you, one two or free shot you, to enemies that you will easily take down yourself and are and barely do any damage, uh, to enemies that are simply frustrating. That's not good design. That's also not good difficulty design when you're dealing with such huge difficulty spikes. And you are. You are dealing with that. There are so many enemies I laughed at in this expansion. And then so many enemies that were frustrating. Or so many, many enemies that could literally tear me to shreds with ease. And that's just fucking frustrating. Difficulty spikes are horrifically bad in any game that they are, especially to this particular level. Combine that to the bugs, the glitches, the problems in the way the the, the talent trees, the abilities, the potions, the oils. When all of that is considered, it's a bloody fucking mess. <laughs> CD Projekt feels the need to make things very annoying. Hey, let's make so many items that require a great deal of grinding 
to get because that's fun. You know, it was fun in The Witcher 2 when they introduced the d uh, dark mode items and they required tremendous amount of coin and materials to make for the short amount of time you could use them. In particular, the third set for dark mode was a, a, a superb example of this. And they keep doing it. Various uh, versions of the same fucking item or the po same potions, decoctions, oils, bombs, all that. You know, one of the reasons I will never replay The Witcher 3 without New Game Plus, for instance, is the fact that I sure as hell and I'm, I'm not interested in ever grinding or searching for those bloody recipes. It's a pain in the goddamn ass. And so a lot of things cost a lot of money, so you're spending time looking for that money trying to get it. And you do have to. You're like playing the game on Death March if you don't do that. It's annoying, it's frustrating, it's a piece of shit. And that's what where I stand when it comes to the combat and the gameplay of The Witcher 3 in general. Not just blood and wine, but in general. Thing is, in the vanilla game, it wasn't so annoying as it came as it is right now. In the vanilla game, enemies were not really that frustrating. Certainly, there were some with some frustrating tags, but more often than not, you could just laugh in their faces if you had a reasonably built character. Ever since Hearts of Stone and now Blood and Wine, CD Projekt's mentality has been let's make things annoying. Let's make them frustrating. Let's introduce stagger attacks. Let's make enemies lightning fast. Let's make let's give them a bunch of bullshit attacks so that that's a challenge. No, it's not a challenge. It's a fucking frustrating piece of shit. And your gameplay designers are bloody idiots if they think otherwise. That's where I stand with regards to the gameplay and combat system. Incompetent in incompetent decision, uh, decisions and idiotic decisions in terms of design, in terms of balance, and plenty of bugs and glitches to go, around, go with it. If there's one thing to be said here is that it feels as if they didn't fi uh, properly test all of this. Getting stuck in the terrain, dying because of the terrain, dying because Geralt swung the wrong way, dying because of all manners of bullshit in the game, is frustrating. It's in Infuriating. You know why Dark Souls is so well liked by the people who play it? It's because Dark Souls knows what the fuck it wants to be and doesn't involve itself in such bullshit. Even the worst bosses in Dark Souls will not sink to the same level of crap that uh, Witcher 3 Blood and Wine does in terms of frustrating experiences. But that's what you get when you have a developer that was inspired by both Mad Men and Demon Souls. You know, that was the design philosophy of Witcher 2. Let's take inspiration from two radically different games and not pick a bloody identity. And that carried on in Witcher 3. The guys behind the combat and gameplay don't know what the fuck they want to be. And may I note how frustrating it is to get stuck in fistfights from various points in the story? When you and not be unable to use your swords or signs or anything like that. Fist fighting one on one, for instance, is perfectly fine. That works. Fist fighting two, three, multiple enemies. Now that's bloody infuriating. The system literally doesn't work for it, and yet the the developers feel the need to involve you in several fist fights, as an example, throughout the story. <laughs> bloody infuriating. Anyway, that's gameplay and combat. Absolute shite. Don't bother playing it for the gameplay, for the combat. And Gwent? I, I like Gwent in the main game, but now they're just like, oh yeah, play this Skellige deck through this Gwent tournament. <laughs> Skellige is a really badly designed deck. Take Skellige against Northern Realms or Nilfgaard. Nilfgaard and Northern Realms will eat it for breakfast. It's only for a lucky stroke that you can actually win games with that. Just saying. So, frustration, imbalance, idiotic design decisions. That's what characterizes the gameplay and combat of The Witcher 3. What about environments? Music, sound, all that. Well, music is pretty good. Even though I think it gets a tad bit repetitive, very repetitive. I mean, it's, the songs are good. They're great. The tracks are great. The ones that play in the open world, the combat tracks, all that. But I do feel they use them too bloody much. There's too few tracks, as far as I'm concerned. The voice acting... Well, minus the bloody accents and Geralt's voice as usual, you know, this is a problem with Geralt's voice, is his voice volume is too low compared to other people in the game. And that, you know, that 
creates weird situations. Um, but beyond that, pretty good voice actors. I, I especially like Regis's uh, voice actor in here. Really good job there. Great atmosphere, improved graphics as well. Still not to the same level as they originally promised us, but hey, baby steps, CD Projekt, baby steps, right? Certainly better, better foliage, uh, for instance, uh, than the base game, better light lighting. Uh, certainly improvements, better water as well. So when it comes to environments, when it comes to atmosphere, when it comes to graphics, when it comes to the sound design, good job, right? Pretty good job uh, from the team. Now that's one of the strengths of The Witcher uh, of CD Projekt, is they can make uh, environments with a great atmosphere, well-designed ones at that. It's just, the, the sad part is that the gameplay that you have in those environments is absolute shite. So, that's what there is to say on a non-story related level. As for the story, this has always been the meat and potatoes for CD Projekt. Because as I established, the gameplay has never been that great in their titles. Story is very important uh, to them. In The Witcher 3 Vanilla, they abandoned many of the things that made their previous games great. If we look at Witcher 1 and Witcher 2, you see subtlety, you see nuance, you see moral dilemmas, uh, moral choices and consequences. Although there are choices and consequences, great ones, in the Witcher 3 Vanilla game, there's very little the sense of moral ambiguity in the main story and moral dilemmas and great characters. The Bloody Baron being the exception in his whole storyline, sure. But that's only a portion of the game. The rest, the whole thing with the Wild Hunt, Novigrad, very little of it. Again, choices and consequences exist, but they did abandon the moral ambiguity, the moral dilemmas present in their previous titles. Looking at Witcher 1 and Witcher 2, they had three principal moral dilemmas throughout the entirety of the game in Witcher 1 and Witcher 2. The what is a monster moral dilemma, deciding you know whether or not the beast is a monster or a vile human is a monster or non-humans. The what is a Witcher moral dilemma in both Witcher 1 and Witcher 2. Lefo versus Geralt in Witcher 2, the identity quest in Witcher 1, uh, what role do Witchers have in the world? And finally, the human versus non-human conflict, Yavin versus Siegfried, Order versus Coyotel in Witcher 1, and then in Witcher 2, Blue Stripes, Roach versus Yorvith, right? That's what, that was, those things, those three moral dilemmas carried throughout the whole of the main story in Witcher 1 and in Witcher 2 are what made those uh, stories amazing. Those were real, serious moral questions, and there were no easy answers. Witcher 3 abandoned not one, not two, but all three of them. There was no what is a monster moral dilemma throughout the main story of The Witcher 3, even though it did come up at certain points. The non-human conflict was non-existent, and what is a Witcher? Also pretty much non-existent throughout most of uh, the game. In Hearthstone, and in Blood and Wine, they focused on what is a monster. They brought back that particular moral conflict, moral dilemma, to the fray. Though the conflict between Olgierd von Everek and Gunfor Dim and Heart of Stone, and the conflict between, well, the vampire human conflict in Blood and Wine, that Laugh, Sienna, the Duchess, Regis, all that. Various dimensions, various choices, were real consequences, choices that are not so easy to make. Some of them, right? Choices that make you think. And that's what makes Blood and Wine good, as opposed to the vanilla game, where the lack of a principal moral conflict really hurt the game. And there was another aspect about the vanilla game that really hurt it. See, Witcher 2 had been built up. The, the entire point of The Witcher 2 was to build up the impending war that would happen in Witcher 3. That's, that was the point of all the decisions, all the consequences. Uh, that was the idea behind the game. And then they didn't care to implement that. They didn't give a fuck about any of our choices, any of their consequences, any of the dimensions of the conflicts present in The Witcher 2. And there were a lot of conflicts. Right? I just talked about the principal ones, but there were plenty of 
conflicts present in Witcher 2 and also in Witcher 1 as well that they didn't care about. So Blood and Wine on a story level is, you could argue, an apology and it's a throwback to things that CD Projekt did abandon in the vanilla game in the pursuit of mainstream success. On the altar of sales, they threw away their integrity, they treated their employees like shit, they lied to people, they downgraded the graphics, and they, they took the piss on the story of the whole series uh, through their decisions. Choices from previous games didn't matter, there was, no, there was a lack of consistency, not only with the games, but also with the books. Uh, there was a lot of idi idiocy, there was a lot of poor writing, there was a noticeable lack of moral dilemmas and good, uh, and good characters. You know, sure, there are things like Dijkstra, Ciri, uh, Priscilla, but it doesn't make up for the fact that Wild Hunt is completely uh, shit as an antagonist. Those are the problems of the main story of The Witcher 3, that, that's the main feeling. And Blood and Wine is a throwback, you know, it's, uh, it's playing on the nostalgia of Witcher 1 fans, it's playing on um, the nostalgia of, I guess you could say, book fans. You know. It really appeals to an older crowd of people, their original fans, which C Project did a good job at not giving a fuck about. Uh, in many ways, not only with Witcher 3, but also in Witcher 2, they did abandon some of the uh, good amount of things that did make The Witcher 1 great. For instance, the identity quest. One of the main portions of The Witcher 1 was the identity quest, the def how you define Geralt pers uh, Geralt's personality there, and then they completely abandoned that. So, Blood and Wine is a throwback to that. I mean, for Christ's sake, you have the Lady of the Lake showing up inside The Witcher 3, and she gives you Arendite again. <laughs> reminds you uh, reminds you to not lose it this time. So what do you think they were playing at here? If not nostalgia, if not uh, throwbacks to the books, throwbacks to previous games. Not so much Witcher 2 as Witcher 1, which kind of makes sense because the people, the writers for Witcher 3 war worked on, some of them at the very least worked, uh, including the main one, worked on Witcher 1, now Witcher 2. Uh, and the main writer behind Witcher 2 has moved on to Cyberpunk. Another particular point of incredible development wisdom from CD Projekt. Hey, let's make a massive game, open world, on free, free platforms, even though our experience on that is limited, while taking some of the best people, including our best writer and the main writer behind our pre previous game, and move him to a new project, while we're making the biggest game in our company's history. Very, very bloody intelligent CD project. I gotta say, that takes the cake in terms of developer com uh, competency uh, as far as the project goes. Anyway, the point is, Blood and Wine is a good story. It, it has a lot of throwbacks, but it also has a principal moral dilemma. The what is a monster moral dilemma, which is something that was missing from the main story of The Witcher 3. And it does a good job, it has subtlety, it has morally nuanced characters, it has ch moral, real moral decisions with consequences, it has a lot to offer. You're in a fairy tale land, a true fairy tale land. There's another story similar to the one of Vincent Mice and Carmen, the captain of the guard and uh, a whore in Witcher 1 about true love. Something similar to that happens in Blood and Wine in a side quest attorney. Um, and beyond that, it's also fairy tale land, the true fairy tale land, and you literally went enter Wonderland, or the Witcher's version of Wonderland, twisted as it were, but you do literally enter a version of Wonderland and try and get someone out of there, including with uh, <laughs> Red Riding Hood and all that, Jack and his beans, the boy who cried wolf, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Really, uh, really nice to do that. It's got a sense of humor. There's, uh, there's a great deal of fun, uh, you know, funny comments uh, and uh, interesting characters in the story, and it does offer quite a bit. It's an intriguing tale. I kind of feel they could have played the whole thing with Sienna better because she shows up very late on and she doesn't get enough time devoted to her in the story. You spend a lot of time investigating things, finding her, and then when you find her, you don't get enough time. Uh, it's kind of a disappointment because she is a child born of the Black Sun, 
which is tied to how Geralt earned the moniker the Butcher of Blaviken. See, the short story where Geralt earned the, the name of Butcher of Blaviken involved him fighting uh, someone, uh, a woman born of the Black Sun, cursed bla by the Black Sun and Eclipse, uh, who wanted to get revenge on a mage who had treated her very poorly when she was young, and Geralt decided to step in, he slaughtered her and her men, um, and and uh, horrified the townspeople of Blaviken, who then cast him out, and that's how he earned the title, in an essence. Because Geralt doesn't believe in the lesser evil or the greater evil, evil is evil. Something that that CGI trailer with the, where Gal Geralt slaughters the Nilfgaardian, uh, Nilfgaardians pointed to. See, the point of that trailer in particular wasn't to say that the woman the Nilfgaardians were about to execute was innocent, rather that she was guilty and that perhaps the lesser evil would have been to let her get her punishment, but because what was happening to her was cruel, Geralt decided to step in. Because evil is evil. A moral of the story. And a moral of the story in Blood and Wine as well, uh, to take into consideration. What is the lesser evil? What is the greater evil, if you want to call it that? That's your decision. What is good, what is bad, who's right, who's wrong. Is Hiana the villain for the things she did? For manipulating that laughing to killing a number of people? Or is that laugh the monster the villain for actually killing those people and then burn, setting a clear on fire? Who is the villain? Who is the hero? That is the question. Who's right, who's wrong? Simple question. Great deal of nuance and subtlety and a lot of time and effort went into answering that particular question. And it comes down to your point of view, I guess. What you decide is best. I have my own choice on that subject. I gotta say, to to a large extent, for uh, the game story-wise, main story-wise, I was thinking that maybe CD, CD Projekt had gone south. Obviously, the game is about uh, two... Uh, the story of two sisters, so I'm thinking they were playing the whole fem strong female character card to appease a certain audience, but then not quite, <laughs> not really, <laughs> right? CD Projekt is still CD Projekt, and they are they are far from being politically uh, correct. So I did like the twists, the turns, I liked the characters, I think that they, they did a phenomenal job. And I certainly did love having Regis, you know, even as someone who barely read uh, the later books. I did read uh, the first two, but I didn't bother with, uh, or, well, read the collection of short stories in The Last Wish, uh, read the portion of Blood of the Elves, read some portions of the later books as well. Certainly Regis is one of the fan favorites, and it's not surprising he showed up. That's something that's been hinted at for a very, very, very long time. Uh, and they did a very good job with him. As someone who didn't care, in a sense, that much about the books, piss poor English translations, that's just what happens. It's kind of, they're, they're very difficult to read due to the poor job at the English translations. Uh, but even that situation, I found Regis to be a very uh, well done character. And Geralt goes on his last adventure, his last story, after close to a decade of playing Witcher games, it did kind of feel that they wanted to give him a proper send-off. They didn't go to the, quite to the same extent as, say, Bioware did in the Citadel DLC with the party and all of that, but they did have cameos from Dandelion to Triss, Yennefer, Ciri, depending on who you romance. It wasn't quite as well done, but at least, at le least with the, was there, it was some effort. Actually, one of the main problems I have with CD Projekt games is that they seem that CD Projekt seems content to go from one game and another and not care about the characters people got invested in, the stories people got invested in. Like in Witcher One, people, a lot of people got invested in the story in characters like Shani or Siegfried or Yaven, right? And then CD Projekt completely abandoned them. And then in Witcher Two, people got invested in Saskia. Uh, in Sheila, for instance, and Lefo, and even though Lefo shows up in Witcher 3, they didn't real they do they did a pretty poor job with the characters that did show up, like Roach, Lefo, and they did an even worse job when they completely ignored characters like Yorvif or Saskia, 
uh, or you know Sheila, even though she also shows up uh, in Witcher Free if she's still alive, but they did a very bad job overall. They don't care. That's kind of the problem. They don't care. They want to go after the new fancy idea. They don't care about the things that came before. That's the dif difference between Bioware and CD Projekt. Bioware has understood that people do give a fuck, that they do get heavily invested in it, and they do put real effort into uh, maintaining consistency, right? Dragon Age 2 notwithstanding. Uh, whereas CD Projekt just goes after the fancy new idea with completely different stories. And that's one of the main criticisms I bring against CD Projekt. It's nice to see them putting a bit of effort this time around, just a bit, a smudge bit, tiny bit of effort compared to the non-existent effort that they had put in previously. Maybe a bit of self-awareness, CD Projekt. I mean, for Christ's sake, the the CEO of the company, Marcin Novinsky, once made the, uh, the claim that when people play RPGs, they put a bit of themselves, their souls, into the games they're playing on. So perhaps, you know, maybe you should realize that taking the piss on your fans and your players, maybe you wanna maintain consistency and just instead of having three different separate games with barely any ties between them. Because that's the situation with the Witcher series. That's my point on the subject. Anyway, in conclusion, as for the Witcher 3 Blood and Wine, the expansion, it took me about 30 hours to complete. I found the gameplay atrocious. I found the combat balance horrible. Uh, and I certainly would not recommend, the, uh, recommend playing it for anything related to the gameplay. Uh, although the fist fighting quest was certainly more interesting this time around than uh, in the vanilla game, with the way it worked. <laughs> there's, a, there's a Game of Thrones reference in there as well. Uh, but beyond that, story-wise, certainly worth it. Certainly mo be far better than the base game. Uh, compared to Hearts of Stone, which was also pretty good, mm, that's a difficult one. I'd say it's better than Hearts of Stone, certainly has a lot more content. More expensive as well, but certainly has a lot more content, mainly through side content, not main story content, but I'd argue the main story is also better done. But it's a shame that on a gameplay level they decided to make it as frustrating as possible in the name of a challenge, quote unquote. And with that, we come to the conclusion of the Witcher series. Sincerely, I hope they don't make another game in the series because I've had enough. <laughs> of them taking a story, building a story with characters, and making us care about the characters, and then throwing that all of that in the garbage bin. I don't care about another Witcher game if they're gonna continue doing that. That's all I had to say on the subject. Kosin here on Serious Gaming, signing out.